is such a joy to see you this afternoon and to be able to um, have a conversation with you and to hear a little bit about how things are going in your life um, since we have last visited. So thank you very much for spending some time with your alma mater this afternoon and people who love you uh, to talk a little bit about things that are happening in your life. Uh, I just want to share a little bit with some of our folks who may not know you as well as some of us at the University of Iowa. Sherry Salata is a very proud and loyal Hawkeye and a graduate of the Tippie College of Business at the University of Iowa. She is an author, a speaker, and a producer who worked with Oprah Winfrey for 20 years. Sherry wrote an inspiring memoir, which I have right here with me. Um, it was called A Beautiful, The Beautiful No, and Other Tales of Trial, Transcendence, and Transformation. And it was named an Amazon best-selling new release and an Apple Must Listen audiobook. Sherry's five-year stint as the final executive producer of The Oprah Winfrey Show is featured in the docu-series, season 25, Oprah Behind the Scenes. Sherry served as president of Harpo Studios and the Oprah Winfrey Network and was named one of Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business. And that is absolutely true. She was also recognized by Hollywood reporters as a woman in entertainment power 100 and earned a feminist press power award. So Sherry, thank you for all that you um, do and all of your loyalty to the University of Iowa and welcome. Hi, Lynette. You know I'm happy to be here to talk to you. <laughs> and I did wear my diamond Hawkeye pin. Just I'm, I'm delighted to see that. We, uh, we've had a lot of fun at some Hawkeye events through the years and thanks for having more of that fun today. So Sherry, I thought we might start today talking a little bit about your love and loyalty for the University of Iowa and how you actually came to be a student at the University of Iowa when you were a young woman. Well, Lynette, it might surprise you to know uh, that I came in pre-med. I was going to be a doctor and I grew up in Waukegan, Illinois, uh, went to Carmel High School in Mondelein. And I was, I wanted to, um, I wanted to find a medical school in the Midwest that um, I could just sail right into. And of course, as, as, as is the case for some of us uh, pre-med students, we don't always fare that well. We're not on the right path. And I think by the end of the first semester, I had been a straight A student in high school. I think I was on academic probation. And I was like, oh my God, I need to switch gears really fast. It you know, the, the person who knew I wasn't going to be a doctor was my dad. He kept saying, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, because I wanted it to be something like a, a, a medical series on TV. But yeah, and, and, and I, got, I came to Iowa through a brochure, Lynette. I, I didn't even come for a campus visit. Somebody, whoever did the marketing materials, <laughs> is that the brochure was so gorgeous with, with the river and, and the town. Uh, that I signed up. I said, I want to be in the middle of that picture. And never have I regretted that decision for one second. Could arguably be the best decision I ever made in my life. Oh, that's nice. Why do you think that? Well, because there was something about the atmosphere at, at Iowa that gave me, I just found this wellspring of confidence mm. that I was at a major university a big university with all the benefits that that brings, all the opportunities, all the, the offerings. But it also, I felt like I was in the middle of a small town mm -hmm. and I was being held, held so perfectly. Um, you know, in short order, I had, you know, a, a, a gang of friends who are lifelong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I still just, even this morning, I'm on an email list with uh, 100 of my 80 Pi sorority sisters, um, and we're all incredibly close. Um, and, and, you know, Iowa is just in my bones now. You're my closest friends. Um, it's my favorite place to visit. 
Um, I, you know, I, I can't wait for the first game. Um, <laughs> and all of you that, you know, when I was, I was brought in as an alumni to have a, a relationship as an alumni with you, I think it's probably eight years ago, nine mm -hmm. years ago, I got this whole nother surge of Iowa life for myself and in getting to know all of you and being a part of things as an alum, which has added such a richness to my life. I, you, couldn't, I, I, you couldn't have told me this was all gonna happen. Well, that's the great thing, right? As I recall, when you um, became re-engaged with the University of Iowa, Sally Mason was the president. Yes, and, she was. Um, you were able to really um, connect with her very quickly as you oh, do. Yeah, I love Sal. Yeah. <laughs> she was great. I love Sal. Listen, that is that could be a harder job than running an international daytime show, I'm going to say, for the yeah. record. <laughs> that, that, that president's job is no joke. Yeah, it's hard and it's it's super hard right now. So yeah, um, the the times are challenging for our institutions of public higher education, but we are absolutely delighted you found your way from Illinois to Iowa as a fellow person who did that a few years back myself. And um, I also thought I wanted to be a doctor until they told me I'd have to take chemistry. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should do something yes. else. <laughs> I think that was that was the 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 the, the barrier. That, right. that finally, um, that finally woke me up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you are a person who I think so well exemplifies the kind of promise that our Iowa students have and the kinds of experiences that they then have while they're on campus um, that help shape them, not only as someone who's getting a world-class education, but as someone who's participating in the life of the university. Right. Were there particular people or um, experiences that you had that you think really helped bring you to that place of feeling like, as you said, Iowa was in your bones? Yes. Um, you are about to um, laud and celebrate a professor who um, was um, my absolute favorite professor at Iowa, Jay Holstein and his, his signature course, Quest for Human Destiny, which was probably the beginnings of the stirrings of everything that's happened in my life since, hmm. which is that this, this really is a spiritual journey, isn't it? And, you know, a career is a spiritual journey. And, and just um, Professor Holstein opening, he, he, uh, Rabbi, uh, we called him back in the day, um, opened me up to, um, I'm, I remember reading Siddhartha. I mean, gosh, I don't remember anything uh, from my classes. Hopefully it just eked right into my, my, my cells. But I do remember that I was exposed to ideas and thinking that um, changed my life, no question. The other thing that changed my life was uh, probably the airliner. <laughs> That was that was where we held court, Lynette. That was where me and my 80 Pi sorority sisters held court. Um, but there was a there was like social training. Mm -hmm. um, there was a there was a um, there was a learning about how to be in the world socially that you could do it in, in Iowa City in such a relatively safe way. Um, that was expansive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'm thrilled that you mentioned Professor Holstein. Um, you're right. We are about to celebrate this month later, um, 50 years of his teaching at the University of Iowa. And wow, what a remarkable impact he has had on so many students. And I hadn't realized that that was oh, part yeah. of your experience as well. And think about it. I had him back in the beginning. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. He was he, he was he was he was still very green when he taught uh, quest quest for human destiny for me. But I re just remember being in a gigantic lecture room and mesmerized um, every time he 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 spoke because I knew I was being I was being asked to open my heart and my soul in a way that I never imagined education could do. And um, it was just so direct and so um, 
so purposeful that I think it kind of infiltrated everything else I was doing. Because after I dropped out of uh, pre-med, uh, sadly, um, I, I scurried right over to um, Phillips Hall uh, to pursue a marketing uh, degree. It wasn't tippy yet. Um, and and then found in, in that, that, that marketing conversation, um, a way, a way of thinking about business and, and brands and um, that continues to inform, you know, the way I do, the way I run my own brand, the way I ran one of the most famous brands in the world. Um, it was, it really got me thinking in a new way about storytelling. Mm -hmm. When I, when I think about that, I think about how many students' lives have been touched through the years by um, the experiences that they have at the university and all kinds of different experiences, right? I mean, that's, that's what's really the most remarkable thing about it. And when you think about the place that you are now and the kind of impact that you had on brand and storytelling and, and really sharing and shaping those sorts of things, I know some people probably imagine that, you know, you got right into that and it was a real <laughs> easy trajectory upward for you, but you have a pretty interesting story as to how you came to um, the place that you knew you belonged eventually. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit yeah. about that part of your story. Yes. Well, you would not know because you, you read my book um, that no. People think that I was hatched like an egg and, and, and sailed right from graduation uh, from, from Iowa right to the Oprah Winfrey show. And it could not be further from the truth. Um, I, I launched myself, oh boy, it, it, a twisty, turny road of um, interesting decisions. I, I, at the time they were called secretaries. We, I was a secretary. I was a typist. I was actually in a proverbial typing pool at a title company in Dallas. Um, I wasn't terribly good at that. Uh, um, but that's when I was like, well, maybe it's law school I should be in. I was, I, was, I was trying to figure it out. I was so impatient. I wanted that, that cool business card with a good title and a briefcase and a, and a suit to wear to work. And I just kept, kept, hitting wall after wall going the wrong way. I ended up uh, uh, managing toy stores. Um, then I was going to maybe someday be a toy mogul. And then I, I moved from that into um, a friend got me in a training program in, in Dallas for 7-Eleven and but did not tell me I was going to have to actually learn how to manage a store. So I ran a 7-Eleven store for eight months. Yes, next to running the Oprah show, that was the hardest thing I've ever done, for sure. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, twisting and turning and then maybe I'll do this and maybe it's corporate 7-Eleven and, and maybe this and that until I finally, uh, you know, uh, ended up back in the Chicago suburbs at my parents' house. I think I was 27, feeling like a failure, you know, feeling like... Um, you know, that, that my story was titled, she used, to, we used to think she had such promise. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, lucky for me, um, in that having to let go of trying to find the trappings of, of a career or, or significance, the trappings of that, I was forced to kind of let go of all that and be like, okay, but what do you want to do? You know, you're going to have to do something every day. What do you want to do? And once I started to ask that question, it's like the universe just started lining up these angels that just stepped in my path. And I, I did get hired um, by my friend, friend from high school's fiance to be his secretary, but he was the executive producer of an ad agency. And now I was cooking because I didn't care. I, I'd sweep the floors as long as I knew I was, I was, I was going to learn something that I really, that I could feel passionate about. Mm -hmm. So um, I became an ad agency producer. So I 
would produce those commercials. Um, and that there was a grooviness to that. No, no, no doubt about it. Flying to Hollywood for a big shoot. Um, there was an excitement to it. And, and I began to see that producing kind of was the culmination of, of my gifts and my talents um, of kind of being the bossy one, making sure that everything gets done. And also the thing I like to do, which is kind of um, being um, um, visioning, like envisioning what something could be and then figuring out the execution of how I was going to lead a team to get there. And uh, I loved it. I, you know, I, I could tell that the craft of producing was something that I really, really was meant to do. And, and then it was just kind of like, but okay, but I'm shooting shampoo commercials. And while that is very, very fun, I knew it wasn't the end game for me. But there was a show across the Chicago River mm -hmm. that was making big news. And it was called The Oprah Winfrey Show. And she had been on the air for 10 years when through a series of crazy, miraculous coinky dinks, I got an entry level position there at 35 years old. So I just wanna mark that for anybody listening, especially if you are a younger person and you don't have it figured out. Fairly entry level position, promo producer, Oprah Winfrey Show, I was 35. And um, so about 10 years later, I ended up as the executive producer of the show. And, and I, I sat in that seat for five years. What a ride that must have been. So crazy. But listen, there were plenty of times where I'm like, I'm not sure this is going to work out for me, this <laughs> career thing. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to figure it out. Um, and, and, and now I look back and I just want to whisper to that um, enthusiastic uh, young woman, that young graduate from Iowa and say, just relax, it's all gonna be okay. You don't have to be perfect here. You're gonna find your way. Just really work on being happy and not getting the snazzy business card. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier this week as we were um, getting ready for this session and you used a phrase that I thought was so powerful uh, and it sounds like actually it's part of what you were doing as a younger person, and that is um, the art of the pivot. Yeah. And we were talking about it in terms of COVID and all of the things that are happening um, in these days in 2020, which seems to be especially unusual. Um, but tell me what you what you think about when you say the art of the pivot. The art of the pivot. Well, it became very clear to me through this year when every single thing I had planned got canceled. So I had just um, just signed with a new speaking agent in January and getting lined up for all these fabulous things and literally boom, 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 everything's canceled. Anything I was gonna do is canceled. I was gonna be the, the author in residence on a trip to Europe, canceled, everything's canceled. I was doing some speaking in Canada, I can't even get across the border. Um, <laughs> so cancel, cancel, cancel. And I remember thinking that there's something here that I, there's a gem I'm going to mine from this experience. And that is the art of the pivot. That, that, and there's, there's a difference, which we'll, I'll explain from what I did earlier, earlier in my life, earlier in my career, that the art of the pivot really is understanding that it doesn't have to be quite as painful as sometimes we make it just, it's like, okay, well, that's like, like instead of in complete resistance saying, no, 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 being developing some curiosity, like, wow, I didn't see that coming. That's very interesting. I wonder what I can do now. I wonder what the opportunity is mm -hmm. here. It's almost like you, you tell yourself that more empowering uh, story, you sometimes get led to new outcomes that maybe that you hadn't, you hadn't seen for yourself. What I was doing earlier in my life was completely, I, I was in such resistance that I couldn't quit a job until I couldn't get out of bed. <laughs> That's not good. I don't advise that. It's like, you, you've got to kind of tune in to your, your, your own vibrational climate. Like what makes me happy 
is the most important question you can be asking yourself in any given moment. So the art of the pivot really is just kind of cruising with the wind. It's like, wow, we're not gonna be doing any paid speaking this year. Okay, let's take a pivot. Let's see where that pivot can take us. Um, you know, you're, you're not gonna see anybody you know for, for six months. Okay, well, I can sit and, and bemoan that right here at this table and just be, just put myself in a state of misery or I can say, all right, well, I'm going to do what I think I've done, but I really haven't, which is really make that transition to that state of being. I keep saying I want to, that, the, to have that to be list and not just an endless list of, of to do's. So that's what I mean by the art of the pivot. It's like change is going to come. You know, you got to make a friend of change or you're gonna spend most of your life quite miserable. So you've got to say change is coming, change is my friend. I'm gonna draft on the energy of which way it's going. And I'm gonna allow myself to be dazzled and surprised by what's possible for my life. That's lovely, that's lovely. And I, I really appreciate that as so many people are going through changes and that they're happening so much more rapidly than maybe we're accustomed to, or at least it feels that yeah. way in, in a moment of a pandemic. Um, it's great to think about it that way. Thanks for, thanks for framing it like that. So we mentioned your book and um, it's a beautiful memoir. It's filled with really poignant and insightful stories. What, what was the tipping point that made you decide that that was the way you wanted to come out of your remarkable career with Oprah and with Harpo Studios? Well, first of all, it's not often. I almost didn't write the book. I like almost three times. I said, I called my publisher to say, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, but it's not often somebody gets that opportunity to work with a fabulous publisher and to get a contract to write a book. Um, and I, I would say that having come from the, um, the University of Iowa and which has the, the finest creative writing program on the planet, um, that there was a little, there was a little bucket list thing for me, like, gosh, mm -hmm. I'd love to write a book. I mean, I was Oprah's book club producer back in the day for, mm. for a stint. So I was like, I'd love to write a book someday. So, so that opportunity was huge. Um, but the bigger opportunity for me was to really do what, what I listened to Oprah say every single day of my life, 20 years, which is become the master of my fate, become the captain of my own ship, um, decide for myself how I was going to spend my day how, what my schedule was going to look like. And I had been working when I was the president of OWN, I had been working with lots of young entrepreneurs and my eyes were opened. Like, wow, this working for yourself thing sounds good. Um, and, you know, sure that all the pressure's on you to deliver the success, but you know, the, the opportunity for that kind of freedom was just delicious, really delicious and just so intriguing. Like, what would that be like? You know, I've been reporting for duty since I graduated from Iowa. So that had been decades of got to go to work, got to come home from work, packing up my lunch pail, that kind of metaphoric um, off to work we go. So the, the chance to, all right, well, what do I want? What do I want to decide? And what's my opinion? Not what do I think Oprah will like? Or what do I think this other boss would like? Um, where you're, 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 you're delivering for others, the opportunity to see what it would be like to deliver for myself was irresistible. Was it frightening? No. Good. No, it wasn't frightening. Good. But listen, I, 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 you know, I, I, I had come from probably the greatest emotional, spiritual training platform on the planet. Um, I'd heard every wisdom keeper, every teacher, every master. 
um, I'd been exposed to so much um, information that, um, you know, it just, it just, I look at it now and it just feel, it feels easy. Maybe it wasn't, but it does. It feels, it feels really easy, like logical, like next step. Here we go. That's great. What a, what a nice um, transition moment for you. So let's, let's do just a little bit of behind the curtain work on Oprah. Um, what's it like producing a show that's that wildly popular and, as you say, really impactful for people? Well, here's the thing. But by, by the time I was the executive producer, that show had been, I mean, between Oprah, the founding producers who were geniuses, um, the incredible team, uh, we, we, were, uh, we were a big machine producing six primetime specials a week. Um, we, you know, we'd, we'd tape in these, these chunks. And I was lucky enough where I got to slide into that chair and, and continue to grow and learn, um, you know, why being surrounded by so much talent. I say that, and then I will also tell you, it, it was incredibly hard. Um, you know, there, you know, people, there's that expression, well, it's not brain surgery. It kind of felt like it. It kind of felt though th that many balls in the air with that commitment that we had to a worldwide audience, our staff commitment to deliver for uh, a world icon, um, it, it, it was a lot of pressure to, to continue to do it well and to deliver. So um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was pretty stressful, but fun, but super fun. And, and what a great experience for everyone to be able to meet those people in this global television audience. Yeah. Were you part of helping then decide who would be on the show? Who, who made the decision as to who the guests would be? Well, the truth is at the end of the day that everything that came on that show was, was approved by Oprah. Mm -hmm. So she was very hands-on on that, which is, which is why our days were so long because we get there before the sun came up to, to prepare for our first taping. We do a second taping. In between, we'd have meetings for shows three months down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, we'd have meetings for shows that we were taping the next day. So the, the days were incredibly long and jam packed and, and making uh, just thousands of decisions a day. And really my job would be to figure out, to kind of know and figure out what does Oprah need to sign off on? And, you know, if I could, you know, uh, use my, um, my, I put my Oprah lens on it, if I could remove some of that so she, she wouldn't, wouldn't be in, inundated and uh, do my best job of saying, this is what she'd like, that's, she's not gonna wanna do that. And, and you know, for all of us, I mean, most of us had been there for years. Mm -hmm. So everybody had, began to get a really good sense of what, what level we had to hit mm -hmm. and that we had to have intention and that, you know, when, when guests and, and the audience, the in-studio audience came, they were coming to Oprah's house and had to be treated like that. And she had such reverence for the audience at home, the millions and millions of people at home. So, man, we had a lot of P's and Q's to mind, Lynette. <laughs> I bet you did. Oh, it's, it's so interesting to think about the way that that show introduced all of those people um, yeah. and, and how you had to help make that happen. Really powerful platform. Yeah. Really powerful. I mean, I look back on it now, which, and I did as I was writing my memoir, like, a, like how do I, how do I contextualize this? Like what, it, I mean, it's not my whole life, but, but it was so pivotal and such a big chunk of it. And it's almost like, I, I guess I could only explain it this way there was something else afoot. It just wasn't a television show. It wasn't, she wasn't just a television host. We weren't all just employees that there was a, you know, um, an other, other dimensional, um,
um, assignment going on there for everybody who ultimately participated, um, whether they were on the show or working at the show um, or hosting the show, that there was, there was something much bigger going on. And that's why it felt so powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did she teach you about philanthropy? Oh my gosh. Well, I remember very quickly modeling myself, like because she was always giving. And most of that giving, like a lot of things were just within the studio we'd hear about or we'd, we'd find out about. Um, but even with, you know, the, the earliest little dollars I was making to kind of be like, oh, this is so interesting how gratifying it is. Mm-hmm. And then when, 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 when I rose in the ranks and pay got better, then it was like, whoa, you know, how, how, how fun it is to be, to be somebody who has worked hard and put yourself in a position where you can add a track to this, your own spirit of generosity. Like generosity is not about money and it isn't about writing checks. It's a, it's a, it's a spiritual practice. It is a part of your vibrational continence, but the opportunity to like put pen to paper, you know, to sign some checks and to, to send that energy out in the world is, is, is super, super gratifying. And I definitely learned that by watching Oprah. Nice. I've, I've heard you talk previously about how incredibly generous she was and how few times she wanted to have any recognition for that Um, so that's nice and it's a lovely way to describe how you learned that from her Um, for those of you who do have questions um, please do feel free to put them in the q and a and as the questions from the audience come in um, i'll share some of those one of our uh, guests has said what do you think the most important quality is um, in a leader? Mm. Okay, well, listen, here's what's interesting. I would have answered that differently a while back. What I see now with a little, a little distance is that the most important quality, and it's not the only quality, but the most important one is being able to lead yourself. Mm-hmm. And that is that idea, that radical self-care and tending to yourself in your life comes before anything. And that is really what you should be modeling to everybody else. And the truth is, I was a very poor example of that for a really long time. But now I see the superpower that that is. You know, I, I come from a generation where you, you, you let blood from your veins, the more you sacrifice, the more, the more you... Um, the, the, high, the bigger your star power, the more you, you sacrifice and give up of yourself personally um, in you know, the, the thinking that you're, you're more valuable as, as an employee or as a, mm-hmm. a worker. And you know, fortunately, younger generations coming up will absolutely not go along with that, which is why the, some of our, the older generations find them difficult to manage. Um, they're just not having it. They're just not having it. And I say that is the change that we all needed to see. And, and so now I say to myself, um, I would do that better now. I didn't do it so well. And so I do it better now for myself. And knowing that you, you, you really can effectively lead anything consistently um, if you're not leading yourself mm-hmm. at, an, mm-hmm. at a very high level. Yeah. I know that you've talked about that a lot on your podcast that you do with your dear friend, Nancy Halla. And um, many of us who are participating today have been fans of that. And Mm -hmm. someone's asking when we might hear from you again on that. Yeah, so the Sherry and Nancy show, which we've had all doing for almost four years. I think we're like some crazy number, like we're just hitting 3 million downloads or some crazy thing like that. However, we decided to pivot and take a year off. So um, Nancy is recently engaged. She moved to the Northwest. I moved to Napa Valley. 
and all the things that are going on here. Um, and she has another business, uh, her own business, as do I. And so we just wanted to work on some other things and take some time. So we're going to take, we're taking a year off, but I think there's like 130 episodes. So we're like, go back to the beginning. <laughs> go back to the beginning. <laughs> go mine those gems from back in the beginning. That's great. Well, it's been a joy to uh, hear those and to hear about many of the things that you're describing that um, about self-care and about the importance of our own pillars in our own lives and uh, taking care of ourselves so we can take care of others, putting our own mask on first in the airplane. That's right. right? And I, I do want to acknowledge um, that Sherry is in her home today, which has been in the midst of fortunately not being destroyed by the fires, but uh, all around her. So we certainly hope that those yeah. will be completely contained soon and that you and your lovely space will continue to be able to be um, together. I know, Lynette, I'm just home. Like I've only been home for like, maybe I, I, I slept here last night and I, I've been gone for over a week and it has been really, it's been the craziest thing um, to watch your, your house on a map surrounded by, you know, purple means fire. It's like, ah! Um, but um, I, as I told you, Lynette, um, when we talked a couple of days ago, I, I ran out with, I had a box, like, what are my valuables? Like my valuables are different than other people's valuables. I mean, I have a few things, but what I care about are the, the sentimental things I can't replace. So I ran and got my rhinestone Hawkeye pin. It was in my box of valuables, you know, along with a lock of my mother's hair who's since passed. That's how important it was to me. Well, that's a lovely, lovely thing. Um, let's see if we've got maybe just another question. Um, This is a really interesting one, I think. Um, so this is actually, I'm going to call her out. This is from our interim dean of the Tippie College of Business, Amy Christoph Brown. Amy! Yay! And she says, I'd love to hear how you made difficult decisions about resource allocation in an environment where everyone is passionate about the mission. Oh, gosh. Wasn't, isn't, isn't that, that a great hard, question? Amy. Thank you, Amy. Yes. Okay, Amy, you're going to try to dump the guest. But here, here's what I will say to you, because I certainly remember every producer thought their show was the, the, the only thing that mattered, because that's how much you have to care about it to do it well. And listen, I my fallback position, Amy, I'm not sure this is going to be helpful to you, was Oprah doesn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or didn't like that idea. Um, no, I was usually more tactful, like, well, um, but it was, it, it takes, you have to allow time to handle and, and, and to handle passionate people who believe in what they're doing when you know you can't give them the resources and you're, they're going to be disappointed and, and potentially frustrated. Um, I, I would try to win them over to my team, like as if we're making this decision together and, um, and that's why, you know, and, and, and bring them on the team. So something isn't happening to them and as opposed as we have to make the, the, these hard choices and listen, you know, sometimes you, you run out of time in the day and it's like, we're not doing that. <laughs> and <laughs> And you'd say, well, I didn't get a gold star in my resource managing with the team today. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, as, as we all know, all of us who have been in leadership positions, that the best you can, the best you're able to deliver on any given day um, is, is going to be good. What a great thing to remember. Sherry, you have um, inspired so many of us through the years at the University of Iowa, and we're really proud of who you are and how you show up in the world and how you remind us to show up in the world. And I want to thank you for spending some time with us today and talking about some of those things and the, the way you've learned about um, the art of the pivot in these difficult yeah. times and 
I, I can't tell you how excited I am to continue watching what's next for you. We've had- Annette, um, Thank you. Thank you so much for that. that. That is, you know, this is to be, first of all, to be out here on this chat with you, um, speaking to alumni and students about what was the greatest four years of my life that continue on all these decades later. And to just think what, what a rich full circle moment it is for me to be in, in, the, in the Iowa family, the, the extended Iowa family and, and, and feel so much a part of it, so close to it. This is, you know, it's, it's an honor of my life. It really is. And I thank you so much for always asking me to come back. Oh, we do, absolutely. When I think about um, a conversation like this, it's, it reminds me of what I call the transformational impact of the power of higher education. And that, right. that's, that wraps everything up in it about what a, a fine university experience can be, not just the academics, but the social and the um, engagement with important things in our community. And you're, you're really a wonderful example of that. So we thank you for everything that you continue to do for Iowa. Mm -hmm.